Hello, universe. Welcome to Pickathon Podcast, episode 31. I'm your host, Dale Schoenborn. Uh, I'm also the founder of the Pickathon Music Festival, and this is a podcast of creative journeys, goofy antics, uh, wild, unbelievable stories, whatever it ends up going, we just kind of like like to go there. And so today, I have an amazing guest, somebody that um, I'm a huge fan of, seen in many configurations, Mike Dillon. Well, you know, I'm excited to bring him into this conversation. One of the things that you know, really feels um, strong in my kind of connection to Mike and we haven't, we haven't met before. So this will be our first conversation is I have always approached life in a kind of DIY sense, you know, I accept for my little brief day jobs where I've actually had a good solid paycheck and didn't have to worry about making art. Cause that was like Bickathon goes back, you know, starting in 99 we did this festival totally DIY. There is so many, I don't know, you know, there are many festivals that, um, and many things that are more business focused. Let's just say that you make things as, you know, organized towards making a profit and you do just enough on things to, and you create a recipe and you can copy that recipe in every town and every place you go. And, you know, it's really sad to say that like in the world of, you know, a lot of creative things, festivals being one, that's how you, you know, you're not getting support. So that's very much a capitalistic world out there and things just literally kind of the things that are most successful are sometimes the crappiest ones because they just, they cut every freaking corner, take everything out of it that they, and they, they bring in the bands that you'll put up with it and It's just, it is a formula and like we, I I know that I've known that we're doing it wrong. Our whole DIY is broken in, in a kind of sense of we didn't need to struggle. We could have just done it. This kind of real straight ahead, cut out all of the, um, the fluff. And that just, ah, it makes me sick to my stomach to think about like, if, if we weren't DIY, you know, if we weren't kind of doing it ourselves, trying to figure it out how to make it awesome in every way and kind of going into weird corners, like what if we got rid of trash? You know, what if we did, what if we had all these amazing stages that are art built into the woods? Oh, and we only have, what if we limited our people so that it's kind of fun for the artists and for us? And what if we had just, music constantly on five, seven stages <laughs> all weekend, kind of overwhelming. And what if we just kind of mixed up all the genres of the best artists and the most essence of these music worlds, you know, like that DIY part is why I know I'm doing the festival. Um, and, and if it was just kind of this kind of rote thing that would pay the bills, the swamp would be pretty drained pretty quickly and it might survive, but it would be really soulless kind of thing. And who cares that that thing happened? Cause it's just going to happen in another city. It just, it, you know, a lot of festivals look and feel the same and you put up with it because there's some great artists that they put all their money towards that you just can't stand not seeing. And then everything else you just kind of like let happen. It just seems gross. So terrible. And if the world is, that's the only thing that can survive, it's not art, you know, it's not, it's not like what makes us tick, you know, and that gets us into weird places. Like we're like, you know, we're in the middle of this conditional use permit thing that we've been talking about for a while. We're just, we're still in that. We're hoping you check in on our newsletter. I know we're asking if you're part of that, our community, we're telling you what we need to kind of help save this year. So like, we're so DIY. We don't even have a home for sure <laughs> next year. And we're having faith that, you know, our community is going to pull through and it's going to be all punk rock and we're just going to sell tickets after we get approval. But we may not, <laughs> you know, and we don't have a plan B 
that's how on the edge we are. And I know, you know, I don't worry about it because the sun's going to come up tomorrow and I'm going to, we're going to figure it out. And I don't have another gear. Like if I had to do it a different way, I just don't. And I really, I struggle with that. And I know our community, you know, kind of grew up and it's magical thing that we did created is only because of that, all of those things. And so I know we share a lot in common. I'm really excited to kind of talk to my guest here with Mike and we're talking about <laughs> a unique past. Hey, I'm doing good. How you doing, Sal? I love your intro and what you spoke of because I love Pickathon. Oh, thank you. It's such a great, great music festival. Yeah, how was your time this year? Did you have fun? <laughs> I had a great time, and um, but yeah, your words just talking about your what you go through because sometimes you're an artist going mm-hmm. through it. You know, there's the art, and then there's like what you were talking about, the bottom line, which is the money, which most artists don't even want to think about. Right. And, it, you know, it takes money to make art. It takes money to throw a festival. Yeah. So and most festivals are on the profit side. You know what I mean? They're taking the. Yeah. And most festivals just book the same old boring shit. And, and, and I'm not really knocking the, the bands that are playing. No. Bands are bands. They got it's, us like, right. it's like making. Yeah. It's like making fun of a tiger for being a tiger. <laughs> uh but, but, you know, in, in rock world, I can tell you all the bands are going to play the rock festival, like Shaky Knees, the, the fest just came out. Of course, I love Queens of the Stone Age. <laughs> of course, I love all the other rock bands. But it's like, it's so, it's, I don't even, they don't even need to announce it. Just announce it like <laughs> corporate rock festival. And, and those people, I, you know, and guess who's playing? And then it'd be like the bands that all have a record out and touring that. Foo year, Fighters. You know? <laughs> oh, yep, they're, they're going to be there. All right. You know? you know, all these bands that I used to see all the guys drinking at the OK Hotel back in 1997 when I was the door guy there. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they stayed focused and they've done it. You know? Yeah, uh, they have. You know, God bless them. I have no issue with I them. I know. But I love your festival, the fact that you have like a band like mine, which is led by a fucking electric doorbell machine, a vibraphone <laughs> going through pickups. Like, you know, and then you'll have the, you have the Meridian Brothers, oh, you know. They were sick, weren't they? You know, oh, I'm glad I saw them. And then that little stage you got where it's like, all right, drive up the side of a mountain in a treacherous four wheeler and nearly die, but you're going to have a great time. And you're, what? A studio session? And, and you're just, okay, and it's really hard to get up there. So it's going to force you to play something different. So even you think you're weird, like in your set, like we got up there and we did this shit that like we've never ever done. And I'm like looking out and going, oh wow, my favorite band on the planet is watching me fuck around. <laughs> <laughs> I it's know. Awesome. That's so great. You know, it, it, it's so cool. And then I watched them do their thing. And I know. Uh, I mean, that's what life's about. It's just like it is exactly, you know, it's about magic and I don't know if you wake up every day and it, you know, I, 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 I totally respect day jobs. It's just like, that's not what this is. It's like, we should be inspirational. Like if we're, if we're just clocking in and taking the same artists, we're not thinking, you know, we're not art either. Right, like I kind of right. think festivals deserve to be art too. They should be like, you should think about bringing and expanding the worlds of that people listen to, because you know, there's, that's how the world gets better is like people get exposed to cool music, right? Like yours, like you blew minds, Mike. It was so fun to see people like seeing you for the first time in the galaxy barn and the, and the Grove, just like, what the hell is that? (laughs) Yeah. And I'm glad that my friends and and folks like you and that y'all, y'all get a band like mine out there because we're not supposed to do anything other than like, play at a little bar to 20 people in New Orleans or whatever, or or like some weird place where people make this weird. I mean, and my music isn't even that weird. I mean, 
we could be weirder, but it's just, it's, it's just something just a little bit different, just based on like the fact that we don't have a guitar player in the band. Right. And, and, and I sing the way I sing. I mean, you but incredible musicians. So you, who you, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone in the band, I mean, our drummer played with Beyonce. So she's been in the most like, you know, top of the world band. All right. And she's in a van with us. That's so like, awesome. You know, like how did know, that happen? How did you meet her? She's a great musician and, and she just, we, you know, she was touring with, uh, with dumpster funk and she has her own band, the nth power, you know, mm-hmm. playing with Ivan Neville. And we just started meet crossing paths in these jam band festivals. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing about it is once you get thrown into a genre, I hate to say it, but you know, a fest like, like say riot fest, mm-hmm. I mean, literally, we had Claude from Ween playing drums with us back in 2014 to 16. We we played Chicago, did our shit that we did, and the guy who started Riot Fest, he came to the show, but and Claude was like, "You got to get these guys; they'll go over great." But because I, you know, because the guy obviously hated us, thought we sucked. (laughs) B can't stand the vibraphone, (laughs) and B hated us and thought we sucked. And oh, and you're a jam band. I hate you. You're never playing my festival. I mean, I don't know. I'm just speculating, but you know. um, But whenever we've gotten a chance to play in in areas outside, like at your festival, we went out and opened for Clutch. We're you know we're gonna play a Budo's band the next time we're in, in Portland on. Uh, the end of January at the oh, yeah. Roseland, January 27th. And I love those guys. They're another one of those bands that just is defying categories oh, and yeah. doing cool stuff. But but whenever we get a chance to do that, the, then people forget the genres. And that's the problem about music. Yeah. Like, it should just be music. Like, mm-hmm. forget the genres. And I know a lot of musicians, they don't like genres mm-hmm. either. It's just, it is what it is. I have no problem with because, jam bands. Because I have most people no listen problems. to everything. You know, most of my friends. Exactly. Who, who, exactly. We listen to everything. And your festival curated <laughs> everything. <laughs> it's hard. You know? It's hard, you know, like, because there's still, there's people that get it and have been and understand it. And then people look at our lineup and they're like, I don't know anybody. It's this not, it is the opposite of the shaky knees, right? It's just, it's like. We, yeah. I mean, if you, the thing about it is if you're into a genre, we probably have one of the things that really you love. And, but we just tend to like collect all these weird genres, right? Like bring in like, like the, the Meridian brothers from Bogota, that they're the, like one of the best, like, as we said, they're like one of the best cumbia bands in the planet. I mean, they, I mean, that record when it came out in 2012, Desperanza, Mm -hmm. they, they blew my mind. And then, and then you had the Zambia rock guys. What are the, what's their name on stage right now? Which they opened, you know, so I was out with Les Claypool this summer playing for him. We had a great tour at the Frog Brigade, which opened for us in Baltimore. (laughs) Absolutely mind blowing. So And then I look and they, they played your festival. Oh yeah. (laughs) Of course. I mean, if we can, yeah. I mean, anything weird and awesome, we like to say it's like this, whatever that essence of that world is, we just try to like pull it because when you see it, right, you can't deny it. You may think you're not a fan of that style. You may think you don't like that music, but that's, that's what's the beauty of like people just like bringing it is that they just, they can, you know, my dad's such a bluegrass fan, but he, once in a while he'll see like, a band like yours are going like, that was pretty good. I didn't think I liked that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Didn't think I'd like it. <laughs> exactly. I, was, I, was, I was pretty sure I was against it. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, uh, we have a connection through Nicholas. Do you know, you know Nicholas Harris? Yeah, I love Nicholas. I was about to say, and Nicholas. I think Nicholas was the guy who lobbied hard for us to play. He here. has, he, you guys have a long time connection. Does it go all the way back to when? When, was, when did you guys meet? A long time in ago. New Orleans, or was it? Yeah, like during Jazz Fest when he was doing shows in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So that could be twenty years ago. I time's flying, brother. <laughs> ah, so crazy. Where did you start? Where did you? Where did Music World start for you? Was that in, was that in San Antonio or in Dallas? Well, I was born in San Antonio, but you know my dad was a football coach, and my mom was a school teacher, so we moved all over, depending on wherever. But by the time in around mid early seventies, I was mostly in the Houston, Texas mm-hmm. area. And that's where I started. I, uh, my mom, because she's a teacher, I was like, I want to play in this play drums. <laughs> so she got me together with the high school band director who got me a 
drum teacher and they made me practice xylophone and bells and timpani and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was where, you know, I was 10 years old when I first started playing the you know, xylophone. And did you know you loved it then or did you come back to it? I, I did know I loved it and I got a drum set shortly thereafter. And of course, I mean, this is like mid seventies. So I wanted to be John Bonham and Peter Chris and, Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, you were in the uh, rush. <laughs> I was in the rock and rush. I was in the rush a little bit later, very shortly in the rush <laughs> and yes. And prog rock. And, oh yeah. And, you know? And so I was playing drums in a band that played a lot of rush covers very poorly, I'm sure, <laughs> but we were enthusiastic <laughs> and I kept staying with drum lessons and, then I got into skateboarding, I'd say my eighth grade, ninth grade, mm -hmm. and, 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 and focused on football and sort of stepped away from music for two years. And then I got into a band in my sophomore year of high school and started taking lessons again. And I quit football and started uh, getting ready for college because I was like, this is what I'm doing the rest of my life. So I went to music school and Where at? I practiced math. North Texas, and that's when I moved up to Denton. You know, the oh Dallas yeah, and that's area. like a really like famous music school too, right? It is like you know when I went there, you know, Maynard Ferguson had gotten a lot of his drummers, like Greg Bissonette. He went on to play with David Lee Roth, mm -hmm. and his Ringo Starr's mm -hmm. drummer, and uh, so it was like you know I read about him in Modern Drummer. It was like I'm gonna go to North Texas and get the gig with David Lee Roth. That's what I'm <laughs> going to do, and, and you know, and I was in drumline, so. Uh, when I got up there, you, you, they put me in drum line. I was like, oh, I'm a really good snare drummer. <laughs> and I started, I did my audition. And, and, and because I'd studied, like, I was in the youth symphony. I had pretty good all around um, percussion skills. Mm -hmm. Nothing great, but but good enough to go, to survive at that school. And But I could play mallets. And right away, I went from playing snare drum in the drum line to you're playing mallets. <laughs> so it was always like, you're playing mallets. You're playing mallets. Life was throwing and you that I way. Just, it just kept throwing me back to mallets. And then uh, I started playing hand percussion and playing in bands around the North Texas area. You know, Matt from Critters Buggin' was uh, living there. Oh, really? And, way uh, back then, huh? Yeah. He and I met in 85 when Matt, he was 18. Matt Chamberlain, was like, right? Matt? Matt Chamberlain, from, great drummer. From he's Pearl Jam. Everyone. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pearl Jam to... You know, he's Belinda Carlisle's drummer right now. Oh, wow. Or whatever they call her. You know, she's, that's how she introduces herself yeah. on stage. Randy Carlisle. Yeah. So, uh, but, so I remember one day he looked at me and I was playing percussion. He goes, so what are you going to do? Like be a rock and roll percussionist, <laughs> you know? And I was like, yep, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, just kept playing in bands. And then one day he, he and I started a band. They got really popular. Which, and, well, which uh, was that? Eber that band was called Ten Hands, uh, and it had a Chapman stick player in it, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was a total like Zappa meets Talking Heads meets Rush, right? You know, prog band. And, in Dallas, right? But, but that down in Dallas. In in in, in, Denton. Denton. in Denton. Okay. And it was it was around the eighty six eighty seven time period. But something happened in the summer of eighty six. Mm -hmm. So I'm like a music school nerd, like playing drums all the time, doing all kinds of stuff, just having a blast, loving life. I stumbled into a bad brain show oh, 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 oh. and that, that was a monumental <laughs> event because uh, <laughs> I was playing with a local band. They, they're like, Hey, come play percussion with us. Yeah. It was the summer 86. I'm pretty sure summer 86. I was just about to be 21 and I go, cool. So I drove down to deep Elm is this little part of Dallas where a, a lot of DYI stuff. There were like, mm -hmm. there was the theater gallery where like the butthole surfers would play. Oh man. What a time, you know, where bad brains played that summer. So I go in, I show up from my, and I was in the steel drum, the North Texas state steel drum. And we had to wear these like Hawaiian shirts <laughs> and khaki shorts and top siders. And I walk in to play with this reggae band that, you know, because they're the weird text punk reggae band and I'm playing congas. <laughs> And the place is just packed with skinheads, and like like all the people you'd see at a Bad Brains concert in A6. And I'm wearing fucking topsiders in a Hawaiian shirt. And then after, you know, they're already like throwing shit. And then uh, Greg Ginn from Black Flag, his band plays second. The place is getting a little more rowdy. And then I'm side stage and this big talk 
dude with dreads offers me a joint. And I get really stoned. And <laughs> I smoke, but not all the time. So I'm just stoned as fuck. <laughs> and I've never been to a hardcore show in my life. And then all of a sudden, the dude who handed me the joint walks on stage and picks up the bass. Oh, my God. His brother starts playing drums, and they go in to pay to come. And all of a sudden, from nowhere, HR comes and does a triple, like a gainer oh my God. backflip into the crowd. <laughs> and the place explodes. There's balconies. People are flying off the balconies. <laughs> and I'm just fucking going, what the <laughs> fuck is this? Yes. You know, and, and to me, still, that moment uh, is so quintessential to seeing energy and music yes. and an explosion. And like feeling like you might die. Yes. And, I love it. You know, like I was just, I was not even 21 yet. I was 20. I'm, I'm like coming from this music school event, like in corporate Las Colinas, where we play like Beatles versions on steel pans of like, you know, da, Oba D, Oba Da, to see like some real shit that was current that was happening. Oh, man. And it changed my outlook on music. Mm. And I basically, and I, and I, I talked to JP from Clutch. I was like, you know, the first time I saw Bad Brains, I just thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it was just so for better or for worse, that sort of like just in your face intensity, even at my young age of 58 is very important, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's so, just kind of like, I don't, I don't know. It's cool though, that, that, you, that stuck such a, you know, that's like the whole idea, like the power of that moment and how it was indelible for you. You know, you just, by bringing that or kind of creating that, it just like, you're doing that to other people. It's like, that's the music has that special kind of visceral thing that almost nothing else has. Right. Like it, it's so true. It's so true. You know, in that same summer I saw Art Blakey play drums. Incredible. So like, right. You know, and talking about energy, I mean, it was the same thing, but a different way. All of a sudden he went on stage and he started doing that oh. Art Blakey shuffle that only he could do <laughs> just like that thing that bad brains did only they could do back then in 1986. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, these phones are great. But back then, if you wanted a record or hear something for your own, you had to go to, like, save up your $10 and go buy a record to hear it. Yes. You couldn't look at your phone and go, well, I don't know if I like their video. <laughs> they suck. I mean, <laughs> like, like, that's just, the phones have ruined. I know I sound like an old guy, <laughs> but I'm so glad that back when I was young, you just heard like, you know, oh, and there's this band, that, these guys, they come out wear socks on their dicks. I mean, <laughs> they aren't like that anymore. They're still running around their 50s with their shirts off <laughs> playing the stadiums, which I found astounding. Yes. But the first time I saw them, I just heard like, and I went to a concert, there was 300 of us, and we were stage diving, and they're playing in their socks. <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and they were still very Ooh, diy back then you know in, so, in 86 it's so awesome i mean and that's kind of been a theme for you right like that kind of visceral sense of like the immediacy of the music i've seen you kind of being part of because i um did you ever live in seattle or was that actually because critters buggin was a huge band out of seattle but it was out of seattle right scaric and yeah so uh so they uh they had started the band with with John Bush on percussion, who was a, a fellow Dallas guy. He was in Eat Brickell and the New Bohemians and a, a dear, you know, great friend of mine. But Brad, who passed not too long, last su this past summer in Critters Buggin, he and Matt were living up in Seattle mm -hmm. and they started the band with Skerrick. And then when John decided he didn't want to do it anymore, Matt called me up. And that was the summer of 96. Mm -hmm. And I'd been leading my own punk funk band uh, called Billy Goat. that just yes. toured around. And, and we had, you know, our strong little followings in different parts of, this country, of the country. But, you know, we, we pissed away our <laughs> record deal because, you know, I didn't want to write 10 of the same songs <laughs> and to play the game. And when, when record A&R people would be like, yeah, that one song's really good. Can you just do more of that? <laughs> it just made my heart go. I know. Uh, sort of like, like what you were talking yeah. about. It's just like, no. And back when you're in your 20s and early 30s, you know, I argue with my wife, who's a very successful artist, about that all the time. She's like, you were so stupid. You were signed by Prince's manager, and all you had to do was play the game a little bit, get famous enough so you could do your own art the rest of your life. But no, <laughs> you're like, fuck you. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do it my way. And you had to piss everyone off and tell the guy who started 
uh, South by Southwest to go fuck himself one day because he thought he was bullshit because <laughs> he was making all the money and not. You know, I played the first South by Southwest. And Mojo Nixon was the hot headliner. Oh my like, god! Like it was an incredible thing back then. Yeah, and I watched it just over the years become like more and more cornball mm-hmm. and more and more corn. And, and a guy like me, I just can't. I can't play that game now. Of course, did I not feel a little? Like, oh, well, I must suck because I'm <laughs> shaky knees doesn't even know who I am. I think I'm so fucking cool, whatever, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. you know, and those are all the emotions you go through when you're a DIY artist. But then you're at the same time, you can go play a city and it's a cold, rainy night and only 25 people show up. But guess what? Everyone there buys enough merch. Yeah that you get to the next town and that's sort of the diy spirit somehow like what you said the sun comes up yeah and, and you're and happier you know out. what i mean like yeah. it's you are happier yeah. like if you measured kind of those special moments that are still happening they still happen i'm you know what i mean they just happen for me seeing you it's like once you start going down the path of you know and it's tough because i don't shun anyone like you need to live right but it's right, it's like right. it's if you can survive long enough, you can maybe have you can kind of get into this special thing that your weirdness is why people are coming, your DIY ness, right? And then it's it's all good. I always think that the a festival or an artist who's really trying to come from a different angle, it just takes time, and you better be patient. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's that's the other thing too to any artist or anyone. As long as you're doing something you believe in, just keep doing it. The yeah. money will come. Yeah. You'll figure out how to survive. You, just like, you know, every tour we do, I, I, our booking agents get it. And I am like, some shows are going to be great. Some shows, maybe they'll be a little low. The shows are always great. But in the end, the money's always going to work yeah. out. And, and that that's the only thing for me. I, I the only reason I would like to be more financially successful is just to be able to pay my band members. I totally more. get it, and that's a, I totally yeah. get it. Like even in the festival world, like we started a festival kind of working for everyone, just working because they it was a dream. And then after mm-hmm. like the second year, they're like, you know, Zay, I can't really take off three weeks and so just like build a festival. And, and I was like, oh yeah, we got to pay people. And then. You know, that whole thing is just like the dream is it's like somehow sustainable, right? It doesn't mean that anyone's going to like, you know, we're just making too many irrational choices to our part of our passion. We just couldn't. It'd be gross to put 50,000 people in there when we because it would just suck. (laughs) It would just suck. And, you know, but at the same time, you know, we are really cognizant. I get it of like the people that we employ, the artists that come It for us. It's actually, yeah, you have probably different payoffs for people. Like one of the only things that I know we do well is like people come and they create, they get, they get new audience. Like, you know, I know if you came on the West coast, things are going to, you're, you know, it's going to have brand new faces at your shows. <laughs> Yeah, we had a bunch of people show up at our next show there when we were opening for Clutch that saw us out. You know, that's awesome at your festival. Yeah, it was great, and and I'm looking forward to going back in a couple. You know, we're going to be back in. January. And I know the collaborations you do, and probably people have been in your band. They've gone on to things. You know what I mean? Like it's just like this big oh, circle. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I we, we, one of my drummers. He's now Miranda Lambert's drummer. <laughs> After he saw my percussionist, he got the gig this summer with Shania Twain. No way. He's like her drummer drummer like he's like dude you ought to start charging drummers to be the drummer in your band you know because they're gonna get a big arena rock gig <laughs> that's awesome so right that's it is. i so mean I'm gonna, maybe i'll start writing that on my uh, <laughs> bio it's like mike dylan band. we we train drummers for the big time <laughs> i mean it's kind of crazy to think of all of the i mean you have been in i couldn't even count i was like trying to count i was like okay you have had 12 records, just your own records, starting from when? Back back in 2008, nine, something like that, or earlier? Yeah, when I quit like doing drugs all the time, I started making records and really just spending all my money on going into the studio. When, when was that? Really, I cleaned up from all the heavy shit in 2000. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, from 90, about the time I joined Critters till 2000, it would be like stay clean for a couple of months and then crawl into a <laughs> dark hole somewhere for two months and come crawling out with my ass. But, uh, 
2000 and earn. I haven't had a habit since 2000. So it's been great. That's but, um, awesome. Yeah. And then I started making records, you know, like, I, yeah, I've made a lot of records. I mean, I can't really go think of all the way back, but I know definitely more than 18 because I know just in, since 2018, I released Rosewood mm -hmm. and I did three records during the pandemic. Yes. It was like shoot the moon suitcase man in 1918. Yeah, I did Rosewood in 19. Uh, um, Rosewood came out. Yeah, I re started recording that in 2018. So I'm saying, yeah, since 2020, you've done five records. Damn. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I got another one that I did with this. So yeah, I did Rosewood, the Shoot the Moon 1918, and Suitcase Man. And then Inflorescence came out. So that's five. And I'm getting this new vinyl that my label does hardly even knows about called The Dixon Cousins that I did with this amazing accordion player. He, she, she played with Ray Wiley Hubbard and Sleep oh, and Brave yeah. Combos. Oh, yeah. Speaking of an, a great band, because like those were the guys that were my heroes when I was in college. Brave like, Combos. Well, they're punk rock. Yeah, Brave Combo. They're the guys who taught me about cumbia, because they do cumbia, polka, you know, just everything under the Are sun. Are they still around? They play some, they're still around. No you know? way. That's so awesome. I really loved that band yeah. back in the 90s. So, yeah, and then I got we started. In, uh, we're doing an all cumbia record right now. No the way, way I do cumbia is where <laughs> where it's like cumbia, and then it goes to speed metal, and then it goes to Love zappa, it. and it goes to <laughs> yeah. So we we got a new cumbia record. We're finishing up, and I got about three or four of the records in the can that I need to get out. But yeah, I think you're right. Probably since 2003, about 18 records. That's nuts. You know, and like of my own, was yeah. it like getting clean? Like, did the music change at all? Like, or was it just more focused? Like, what was the how do you kind of like see that whole chapter affecting you? It was, it became more my voice because the records I did in the nineties were with the band and I always wrote the lyrics and would participate with the songwriting, uh, you know, be there. But usually I was very reliant on a guitar player to like come up with a riff and, you know, the, you know, so you sit there in a band setting and we wrote some amazing stuff for Billy Goat that way. Mm -hmm. And then, in, in 98, when I moved to Seattle, getting back to Seattle, I moved, wait, no, the summer of 97. That's when I worked at the OK Hotel and all that stuff. So I, I was living in Seattle and I had this vibraphone. That's when I first started writing music. And I wrote music for the Harry, Harry Ace Butt Movement Experience because Billy Goat had written out. So we made three records as the Harry mm -hmm. Ace. And I wrote, I wrote most of that music and the keyboardist wrote. And then, yeah, and then like, uh, right around 2000, then, you know, I started writing for Critters Bug in the last couple of records. They, I would have a couple of songs on. The last one was in 2005. But I just think I just became more like, since I wasn't wasting all my time doing drugs, it was just like, all right, it was a <laughs> method of like sanity. I couldn't afford a therapist. So I just, you cold know, turkey, huh? Wrote, wrote music all the time. That's you awesome. know? And I started jogging a lot. That was the other thing. <laughs> Get it, like That's when I started jogging. Natural drugs. <laughs> exactly. That's actually, I love running. It's my favorite. That's my favorite. Like, yeah, you know, always feel better. And I like, I can't stand go indoors and run. So like, I'm just an outdoor runner. I hate running indoors. Oh, I, I mean, like y'all got that. I love running the bridge around Burnside Bridge, that area where you go around oh, the yeah. and you got the little Yeah, the, train east, track. the east side Esplanade or whatever there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, whatever they call it. It's great. I run that whenever I'm in Portland. And the last time I run, I was like, wow, the homeless situation is getting out of hand. It's always been there. But now they're like chasing you while you run. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty burly. It's actually now it's back on the other side. They've they've kind of cleaned it up. But man, I did a run in I was it 2021 or 22 during COVID. And I did yeah. like uh, the, the Johnson Creek. And that was the worst, worst of it. And like you would run down Johnson Creek and there would be it's like kind of like along a creek and so campers were lining both sides it felt like a gauntlet i was like okay right, right what do i got on me and then do i feel fast and i'd like just keep something in the tank just in case i needed to start sprinting you know like somebody was yeah. gonna like it was nuts i mean it was it was it was like a weird time because it was like covid so everyone could camp and I, I could judge like every third camper was like some kids in their 20s that just wanted to party and like no one was kicking them out, right. you know, it was like a mixture of like right. people that needed help, didn't have anywhere to go. And then these young people, they're just like, ah, eh, I'll just post up here and camp and <laughs> party. <laughs> shoot drugs, shoot drugs in the street. I, 
Yeah, you know, or just I, weed. I saw a lot it of was, that. Yeah. yeah, or just weed. Yeah, there's plenty of that too. Yeah, I mean, uh, they were just like, it, I don't even think everyone was all like drugs. I just think they're just, they were just kind of like, yeah, it was weird times. I mean, for us as the festival, like, yeah, I, I mean, it, you cranked out four records or you, cause you mm. had a solo one going into it. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So like, it, how was Seattle? So what is this okay hotel? I actually don't know much about it. Is there some lore there? Oh, okay. Hotel. There is some lore there. It, it was this classic uh, club that I remember I played there the first time in 91. They, it was a great bar run by Steve and uh, his wife. And they now have the Royal room in Seattle, mm. but it was sort of like, it was just sort of like this living room bar where I, I, when I got the job, everyone was like, all right, you know, you know, you're the security guard, but these guys are always here. And if anything happens, they'll take care of the situation. And it was literally, you know, it, it was Ben from Soundgarden and Josh Homie, oh, And, you know, there, they, there was always those dudes and their crew were hanging out there. I remember, like, the Queens did one of their first shows. They, I don't know which one it was. it was. That was spring of 98. So I just remember they were playing in the back and I was doing the door. <laughs> and every rock star in town showed up that night and I was like, Oh shit, it's Mark Arm. I'm checking his, you know. <laughs> but it was just a real family bar and, and a great place to play. They had a front room and we all played there all the time. And if you were a bigger band, you got to play in the back. We opened for the Dead Milkmen back there the summer of ninety two. We toured with those it's guys. It's crazy because that's when Seattle was really in the kind of the heart of like the contemporary rock scene, you know? It's so it's true. It's so not like doesn't feel like that anymore. Like that doesn't you know, but it's, and I moved here right in 97. So I kind of missed it. You know, I feel like I, Portland was starting to become like its own thing then. Like, and ever since I've been here, Portland's always been like the, just, just cheaper, I guess. So there's more, there's more crazy artists here. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to move to Seattle and uh, I remember the wife said, all right, if you can find a place for, and that was my first wife. If you can, uh, find a place for me and the dogs it's affordable i'll come out and i lived there for a year and i never found a, a place that was affordable yeah. so by 98 this artists were getting priced out already mm -hmm. and now it's through the roof and you know that's one thing i like about portland y'all have always maintained this weird do-it-yourself <laughs> whatever God, subculture you're, you're into there is it's here in spades <laughs> it's there <laughs> Yeah, it's great. It, it really is a, its own unique place. People fear it's missing, gonna miss, but it's still somehow kind of just turns over something that you know. I, I I've always liked that about Portland, but I, I'm always I'm fascinated because I felt like I missed something not seeing Seattle in that time. Like you know, it is. Where did you move? Uh, from? I moved from. Well, I grew up in Kentucky. And then okay. I was in Colorado. I was actually a mandolin player in the middle of like the string cheese incident being born that world. I was, you know, nice. um, and then I decided that I was going to get a job and worked here for, and, you know, moved here with my, with my, before my wife is my wife and we've lived here ever right. since. So, yeah, Great. I mean, it was wild because being from Cincinnati, there wasn't really a town like Cincinnati at the time and Covington and my, my, where I grew up is it's always about backyards and basements. You know, people hung out at people's houses. They didn't really hang out all the time at like places or venues or, you know, you'd go to like skyline Chili or something that was next to Kroger. Chili. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know that area you're talking about over there. Southgate uh, house. I'm sure you've played there. The place we played all the time was this place called Sudsy Malone. Oh, Sudsy yes. Sudsy I Malone. remember you do your laundry. <laughs> you did your laundry and there's rock and roll shows there. And Billy Goat would play there. And the place would be packed. Bogarts and, and Sudsy Malone. Making the same. <laughs> and then, yeah, then, you know, I was less. I played Bogarts lots of times. Oh, yeah. So. That was like, you know, I don't even think Sudsy's is there. I don't know. It's not. Both. It's not there anymore. It's not there. But it was that was a pretty rock and roll place. I love that place. Yeah. Cincinnati for me was like a, you know, just like made me kind of like punk rock in a different way. Like you don't need much to be happy. If you grew up in Cincinnati, you can like literally, right. <laughs> right. cause you're just like figuring out, like there's not a lot of culture when I was there, but now, you know, I hear it's actually a cool place. People say it's totally different. Um, but I haven't been there in a while. 
yeah, we played some new fancy place with the Frog Brigade uh, the day before Halloween. Oh, wow. It was like our next to last show on the tour. And uh, yeah, Cincinnati's changed a lot. In- but it's still the same in this weird way because it didn't take me long to see a Skyline Chili. <laughs> I love Skyline Chili. I do. And I do love, yeah. I do love, uh, I mean, I took lots of stuff in Kentucky. I have like lots of friends from there. But yeah, yeah I mean, from, I mean, when you lived in New Orleans, was that, like, how did that like kind of really influence? Because like I've, you lived there for a while, right? Yeah, and I still have my apartment there. Uh, and I, and I can't give it up. And I, you know, I, I consider myself a dual resident. So I've actually a, a triple resident. It's like Texas is, is home. You know, my, we got the family land there and, and uh, eventually I'm about to move back there full time to take care of my mom who's still alive. That's, and then Kansas city is the wife's world where she does all her art and mm-hmm. she owns a business there. But New Orleans is where I get my music uh, soul fulfilled. Oh, man. And, it, it, it's you know it's like every other town you know new orleans is special it's a great city because it's so unique and it maintains this unique thing that we're like there's music in in every neighborhood there's bars everywhere that have all kinds of music and uh the forces of evil are trying to do the same thing they did to bourbon street mm-hmm. you know believe it or not one time james booker was playing gigs on bourbon street and no way. dizzy gillespie and all the cats were playing on bourbon street and then that changed in bourbon street and, and then everything moved to frenchman street mm-hmm. and now frenchman street's been fighting you know it used to be like everyone would go drop ten dollars on a cupboard there'd be 500 people at your shows at dba and the bar owner would give you four grand for being an unknown band and then everyone in the band could pay the rent that month. Yeah. You know, that, that was new Orleans. And and one night it'd be like some weird trad band with a bunch of weirdos who moved over I from love all it. over dressed like steampunks. And the next night, you know, maybe the Cajun Mark band Dudrow or be doing yeah. a thing. Then, then a Cajun band, you know, like, you know, lost by you ramblers, yep. what those kids have done. Mm-hmm. I love them. They're doing a unique, cool thing with the music. And then, you know, like Ivan and Neville and all his crew of people, what they've done and continue the legacy and, uh, of the great music. And then and, the mashup then of like, all the jam bands that kind of take it all and kind of mash it together, you know? Yeah. And then there's that. And, and when you're in New Orleans, you know, you got either like the, the, the legacy of like the Fats Domino and the, the Meters and the Neville Brothers and. I mean, and the list is just the Marsalis family, the Batiste family. I mean, there's just all this heavy music. And and then like Ernie Cato and, you know, uh, Eddie Bo and the hook. Like just so much great music. Irma Tom. I mean, I could just sit here. I know. And, and then you got a guy, guy like Quintron and Miss Pussycat mm-hmm. who's over in the Bywater who's been making or like what the modern press hall has become. And then you got Galactic and their thing. Oh, yeah. You know, and then, like, there's this new band that called the Iceman Special, and there are these kids that are like, like their uncles are Zydeco players, and their guitar players seventy in the seventies, and they're doing oh, this weird mashup man. of like Kraut Rock and Zydeco meets the Almond Brothers. Oh so my it's god! Like part part jam, but then it's like, wait a second, they're playing Kraut Rock beats. Like Iceman Special. Know it, know it. That's that's so awesome. That's so New Orleans. Yeah, and, and they're really cool, and they got their own scene. And then, you know, of course, then you got like Pepper Keenan, who lives there, and, you know, and, and you know, down, and of course Phil, and then you know, like I hate God with metal. I mean, come on, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother scene that that those guys have been doing, and they're badass. So it's a town it, built it's, it's on really music, cool. man. It's just it's just built on so much culture there that is. You just you root for a town like that not to like disappear. Like I just feel, and, and I, yeah. And there's one other, and then what's the last kind of bands I haven't talked about? I know I haven't covered everything, but then you got all the brass bands. I you know? love brass band. I mean, I can go on I mean, and on. Come on, this, and it's the greatest thing to walk onto a corner, right? Yeah, and just like a neighborhood brass band, almost all of them can just hold court, right? And just like it's fucking amazing to see if you've never accidentally been in the middle of a brass band on a street corner in new orleans you don't know what life is yet <laughs> you don't it's, it's incredible you know in most towns you see kids with skateboards 
uh, of all ethnicities and races. Brass man's cool in New in Orleans. Yeah, in I always love that. You see kids with skateboards and horns. I love yeah. it. I just so love that. You know, I saw that also. The only other place I saw that was like in Oaxaca, Mexico. Like no matter right. where we went, right. all these brass bands would like pop up in these par- like impromptu street parades. And we went to this Halloween thing in this little town, like just no one would go to. It wasn't for us. It was like, this is what they do. And like neighboring kids dressed up as zombies, like they were walking through the town and like like versus versus kind of brass bands and whoever like it was like a showdown and wherever they went it was like a party when they met <laughs> they played against each other and you could follow yeah. one of these bands through town and ended up in somebody's backyard and when they played whoever's house they were had to like serve drinks to everyone <laughs> really that's a, that's great yeah i just love you know and that's something that you know you just feel like there's should i mean I know that whole thing kind of circling back to the DIY, you know, like that is a whole town of DIY, you know what I mean? That's grown up and these scenes have become mature and like are just in, been invented and kind of created over time, right? Like so many people took the mantle and kind of pushed it. And now you have just such a wealth of, of just unbelievable things that don't exist other places except for New Orleans because it's, it's true. I mean, it, it, and what it is, it, and, I, and I hope that rents don't ruin it, but it's because artists can still move there and live in that city yeah. relatively cheap. Because if an artist is just working all the time, it's going to be hard for them to, to be a you know, DIY. Be 30, <laughs> yeah, there's got to be 30 hours of work a week and somehow you can pay your rent from that and then you can make your weird music. Yeah. And eventually you start paying your bills and making the music. And, and it seems like, like we were living in this one apartment where a lot of musicians were living. The lady was just getting so old and she didn't want to sell her apartment. I mean, we had $500 a month rent there. And it was right there on Magazine Street. And she was just like telling our, the guy that sort of was the liaison between all the, the renters there. We were all musicians. Even like Brian Blade had lived there back in the 90s. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so it was a known famous musician flop house, basically. You know, 10 apartments. Uh, in the whole little complex. And she finally had to sell it because she was getting so old. Her partner had died. And she was like, my poor musicians are going to get thrown in the street. I know. I know. Is how, how Doug Below described so it. So awesome. And eventually that happened because the first, the first, she had to sell it. She was in nearly 80. She sold. Then the new people that bought it tried to just raise our rent to 800 bucks. And then they came and said, look, we're selling the building. We can't even get out on the back. The property taxes they want to put on us now and to get it up to code, it's going to cost like a gazillion dollars. And then they sold it to someone and we got like notice in 30 days. You're out. And, and they, they, they made them super fancy and they're 2,500 bucks a month apartments now. So that's 10, 10 musicians that don't have a place to live and to make weird music and pay their 600 bucks a month rent just playing gigs in New Orleans. And, and 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 I hope that doesn't go away. Me too. Because it was so great. You know, there's all these little bars in New Orleans where guys just pay the rent, and they're they're great players, and, and they're whether it's trad jazz or, or whatever they're doing, yeah. they're doing music to survive. Yeah. I am like the I'm DIY brother. DIY brother, man. That is that is the theme of of, and I you know you want it more. Like I always kind of harp on this like you know lots of places around the world support their their you know music and culture right and so like the only way it really this things happen is if it's cheap enough town and there's enough people you know that can gravitate there i mean i do feel like you know you just have i don't know you just have to be a little a little smarter and little kind of you know i i wouldn't do it any other way and i know you probably wouldn't either right if you had to do it all over again would billy goat do 10 of those songs (laughs) nope (laughs) nope and i can't (laughs) i know i don't know i don't know maybe somebody will look back and say god you were the dumbest dude ever you know zale you should have run you could have made pickathon huge and been famous and made tons of money and I was like, you know what? I probably, somebody walked away from that festival, their life changed 
And that's probably, that actually gives me fuel. <laughs> I don't know what that is for me, yeah. but yeah. Um, I, I can do it again next year because I know it's this passion, right? It's not a, it's not just a job. Like I, I'm all motivated. And now that I'm in my fifties to be like some, okay, how do we make this thing actually work for people? Take care of people. I'm less punk rock that way. But I, you know, at the end of it, the, there's no more money. So it's just like being a little smarter, <laughs> not, not necessarily, you know? Yeah. And those, those kids in the ice band special, I remember I was out there hanging out with them during COVID. I guess it was the summer of 2020, the first summer. And so they just were holed up on their family's land in the middle of uh, Oakdale, Louisiana, oh, this man. old, old uh, decommissioned, you know, wood mill. Cause that was where the swamps met the grasslands. So that's where the, you know, trees would be brought to like, to be sent up for people to have wood. So we're sitting there and I'm looking at them. We're taking a break from recording. And I'm like, to Hunter, the drummer, I'm like, what are you watching? Steve? He's like, dude, I'm watching Pickathon. Like y'all were doing some streaming or like replaying sets from festivals years earlier. <laughs> and these kids from Oakdale, Louisiana, they're like, our dream is to play Pickathon. Oh, that's so awesome. You know, and, and, and see, and that's what you're doing, you know, and you don't know that when you're just like going, all don't. right, how are we going to, how are we going to get our permit to do this another <laughs> year? Why is it such a struggle? Or if me, it's like, all right, how am I going to make, uh, make ends meet on this tour? Yes. And my credit card's maxed out. I got to get everyone hotels. Whoa. Why? If I was any good, I would have more money. <laughs> that's the weird thing about it. If you were any good, I because know. we've all got, we've gotten that, you know, we've mm -hmm. gotten turned down from record labels, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've been told that all along, you're no good. And I'm sort of glad because my attitude to you're no good is that. <laughs> yes. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and it just makes me play harder. But it is great when you hear someone like say that, it, you know, something you did made a difference in their day and gives yeah. them some dreams. Because that's what we're doing here. Yeah. You know, like when, when I, we opened for Firehose back in 1988, oh. I'm sure we were terrible, but, you know, I saw Mike Watt, Mike I saw Watt. the band, oh. and, and, you know, and, and Hurley and oh. Ed from Ohio, and they were just piling on this van. And at the time, it looked so exotic and so cool. And I was just like, <laughs> I want to be in a van one day touring. <laughs> and here I'm at 58, <laughs> still in the van. And that's why I was asleep at the beginning of this because I, I've been driving again. I'm out of the tour bus and I'm grateful whenever I get a minute on the tour bus to take a break from driving. Hats but, off, know, man. We're, we're doing the drive now, brother. Just like I know Mike Watt is still driving the van. That's so freaking awesome. You know what? It just fills my cup. Like I'm 54. Don't know whether we're going to have a festival next year, <laughs> but, uh, you know, all the chips are on the table. So we're, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's like, it's like you're, you just have to have faith, right? You just, you have yeah. to have your passion, the faith, and you know, it's going to work out. I mean, that's what I kind of, you know, I tell my wife and people around me like, okay, I don't, you know, it's going to work out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> it's going to work. Y'all going to do it. You know, those, uh, those developers, it, yeah, they're going to be developers. That's what developers do. And it sucks that they've encroached on y'all's beautiful, you know what? beautiful it's, farm. It's what it is, but it, you know, we're trying to, we're going to, we're going to figure out our terms or survive. I'm like, you know, this, there's, there's enough people that want that farm to be not apartments and houses. Like it could like the, the, that farm owners, if they have any normal, Americans, they would have sold it a long time ago, but there is, right, there is out right. there as you and I, Mike, they just, they're like, we got a dream. We want this to be an arts place. And I was like, okay, well, hang on. We're together. We're the, we, we, that's where we match. That's part of the reason right, Pickathon right. works. And, you know, anyways, I'm just like, yeah, it here, it gives me a lot of optimism to talk to you. And it's been really an honor to yeah, talk to you today, great. my friend. It's been an honor to talk to you. <laughs> Keep up the good fight and I'll yeah, do the same. Yeah. And we'll be crossing paths for a long time to come. Hopefully I get to like, uh, see you you know shortly sometime soon come to the, come to the roseland saturday january 28th we'll, I'll, I'll be I'll there in touch with you all right all right good to see you thanks for having me hey everyone this is the end of pickathon podcast uh episode 31 with mike it's been a real pleasure 
I know you guys have something you're, you're working on. Just hope you took away from something from us. It's probably damn worth it. You know, go put some socks on your dick. <laughs> go play some music. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, everyone. You've been listening to the Pickathon Podcast. This podcast is produced by Zell Schoenborn, Tanner McCullough, and Evan Throckmorton. Our artwork is by Travis Bone and additional support by Ryan Stiles. The music you heard in this episode was by our guest of honor, Mike Dillon and Punkadelic. The songs included were Devil's Playground, Shoot the Moon, and the one we're riding out on right now, Never Been to Paris. Be sure to check out our Pickathon Patreon, where we have exclusive interviews, content, and insights into the Pickathon world. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you hear your podcasts. And tell a friend about where they can get on the Pickathon bandwagon. Thank you to the whole Pickathon family. And like Zale said, we'll catch you all next week. Mm-hmm.